Now, hi, let's get started with our uh, class on gilding and, and a little bit of carving or sculpting. Um, so let's let's start from the finished product and let's let's move uh, backward. So uh, we're going to start with a piece of timber, and that's all we're going to say for now. That's how I started this. So this is a a, a finished panel that I did a number of years ago, and this is done in pine, and uh, you probably could see it's a little bit warped and dried over time and quite rough and crude in the back, even even a bit cracked. So, but nevertheless, that doesn't matter. So what I did was I took my panel, my theme, which was, uh, you know, chinoiserie, uh, Chinese, the art of, uh, you know, the Chinese drawing, and they were actually starting to do some drawing here. And what I did first was I wanted to isolate the, the picture or the carving that I'm going to do. So by doing that, I took chisels, and we're gonna show you your chisels, but I took these kind of chisels and I leveled. By pushing in, I leveled the background to create this relieved area. At that point, I came with a pencil and I drew the figures, I drew the trees, I drew these traditional Grecian key type Chinese motifs, part of the pagoda. So I drew the picture. And then I started taking carving tools, sculpting tools as some may call them, and I'm actually going to, you know, carve in. And uh, again, this is the overview, but I'm using these type of carving tools. You're going to have 12 different tools in your set to relieve the, uh, the background and to make what you want to stand, your theme, what means something to you stand out. Then I came back and I did the proper exercise in the technique of water gilding using gesso, clays, and you can see the red clay is inside still. That did not get gilded. Um, so using the, the proper water gilding technique and then applying the gold, and in some cases, actually sanding through the gold and sanding through the gold to give, um, sometimes I wanna give some facial features and sometimes I'm trying to show some antiquity. So antiquity in places like here and here that the gold actually gets abraded or rubbed off. And in addition, they're standing outside because we have trees. And I threw some, some sand down into the wet medium in the background. And it stuck sand with some actually some gold powder. So it kind of looks like a little bit of gravel sits there. So, um, And then I come over and I seal this. And we'll talk about this later. But I seal it with a, um, a gelatin type seal. And uh, I did a little patinization. So I did a little little bit of, uh, you know, putting some detail in, and, uh, and that's about it. So let's uh, get ready for the next class. So let's, uh, let's talk about the gold that we just saw on that theme panel, those gold uh, chinoiserie or Chinese figures in the trees, okay? So we're going to be using 23 and a half carat gold, and this is considered gold leaf. And when I talk about gold leaf, I almost think of this as a veneer. And this is an eighth of the thickness of a human hair. This started life as a round size of a dime of gold and was pounded by a man and a hammer into a much larger circle. Then it was cut by someone squared and put in these inside of these this parchment book. So these are called gold leaves and you have 25 gold leaves that make up a book. And it's very delicate stuff. If someone were to come in and blow like that, you can see some movement. Uh, this is probably about $3, one gold leaf, okay? So we have to be very careful. This is called a gilder's cushion. The gilder will hold this and he will dump these pieces, and we're not gonna dump them yet, but we're gonna dump these by blowing them into the cushion and then being able to use them. So one of two ways, either we do that or we take, a, we take a pair of scissors and we cut up small squares and we pick these pieces of gold and we attach them to where we, we need them. So if we had our panel here, we could cut a piece of gold leaf, a square piece, and pick it up and we could attach it. Now, in your theme panels, if you find something else more decorative in color that we want to do additional leaf with, we may want to take a piece of silver leaf. This is very old. This is about 100 years old, the turn of the century. Cut a piece here, pick it up with a brush, 
and stick it on to where we want to keep it. In addition to, we have copper leaf, and we have, I only have two boxes of variegated leaf. Okay, let's suppose this is our wood panel. I know it's much larger. This is a panel that I've been carving. It was a, it was a mask or it was a, a, an emblem representing a family, it's still in process. So in general, the first thing we're gonna talk about briefly here is carving tool safe, safety. Your tools are gonna to be a bit shorter than these, um, but we wanna, this is the hold you need, and you can hit or push in this direction. So I can come here, I can put the carving tool to the wood, and I can hit, or I can push, pushing my weight down. And what we all have to work on is understanding how to read the grain. But beyond that, the tools are sharpened on the underside, and they're not sharpened as much in the top side. So. You have, when you get into the wood, you can start turning left and right. You're, you're pushing power through and turning left or right. When, initially, when we take our piece of wood, which this was, and we put our drawing on it, we're going to get um, one of our carving tools, one that has somewhat of a V. And this is an outline tool. That's how we get started here. And we put it on our pencil mark, and we start to hit and get a hitting motion. If you don't want to start pulling right away, but the hitting motion is a good basic beginner's motion and just follow the line like such and you're creating a V and you could you can make this V go many ways any way you want and you can turn it as you're going but always keep this planted because remember safety is first because these are very dangerous so when you have the one hand holding it down like this you're, there's there's no way you're going to hurt yourself because it's always you're always carving or cutting away from you like that okay and this could be I could be doing an outline of a sun a flower um, any number of things and it's just the beginning and then we're going to move on after that we're going to move on to a larger tool and we're going to actually evacuate more material like this so once um, once we get our basic carved shape, I mean, I'm not finished with this, but we're just going to move on to the shape of the gesso. Let's talk about the gesso. So we need to seal this because our gesso is going to be absorbed. Gesso is nothing more than plaster powders. It's calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is, a, is basically limestone with a couple additives ground down. And when you add water to it, it dries to a hard surface. And it enables us to sand when it's when it's dry, to sand it very smooth to apply the gold to. But for preparation of this, what we're going to do is we need to put a size or a glue down. So we're going to put a, a, a size that will make up. And just by applying this very dilute mixture, it's going to seal most of the pores of the timber. Okay. And, and that's about all we have to do. And what that does and we can do this almost simultaneously. So we're, we're sealing the pores of the timber here. And we're not being pretty about it, but a lot of the, the moisture is going to absorb. Now, why the, why the timber or the wood is very wet, we're going to come on and we're going to take our gesso, which I, which I have gesso made up. This is the gesso we'll be using. And I'm going to apply the gesso. And I want to float the gesso. I want to put a lot of gesso in because I want to fill in any any irregularities and any concavities that exist that I don't want. So but what would happen if, if I normally put just the gesso on the wood, it's going to suck the moisture out of the gesso too fast and the gesso will not properly, uh, it's not going to properly set. It's, it's always going to be weak and it's not going to let us to do much shaping to it or sanding. So I'm putting and bathing more coats and more coats, almost dabbing it. Um, and I mean, there's not no real big secret here, but we don't want to see brush lines. We don't want to keep pulling through it as it's drying. And it's going to dry rather quickly. It's going to tack up. So this is what we're doing. And uh, so we'll do it on both sides. And uh, we'll continue on. But the key here is to put the sizing on first. And once we get this down, once we get all the gesso down, we can come back and start building more gesso and shaping um, see, right now, I'm, I'm putting an excess in the center line of the leaf. So I'm actually starting to build up, and uh, that's going to maintain itself. 
Hi, Greg Perry, the Historic Preservationist. Welcome to the Conservation Studio. Just going to go over some gilding. We've probably done some of this before, but we're going to recover some uh, territory again. Uh, got some things coming up. Just wanted to show you some other things that I've been doing. Uh, doing some raising. So I'm using creating the birds, doing some chamoiserie panels. But let's go back first. Uh, panel I did a number of years ago, about 20 years ago piece of pine, typical piece of pine. It's actually twisted and really warped at this point. Hand planed it down the back. And uh, what I did was I carved, relieved the outside border to give a proud surface of a, of a border. It's uh, maybe 3 16ths of an inch around. And then I went and I evacuated. I relief carved. I drew my picture of a chinoiserie uh, picture of three individuals, trees, and part of, of a pagoda. And uh, you know, using some background. Uh, in here, I'm just using uh, some, uh, some rabbit skin glue and uh, putting some sand here to get an effect of the ground and some black pigmentation to get a background. And then doing traditional gilding using uh, traditional methods such as uh, plaster Paris whiting and uh, over all the figurines, all the trees and the pagoda and applying traditional gilt. And down here is some silver gilt and here is a traditional gold, 23 and a half karat gold. Here's a little bit of silver here. Uh, a little bit of rub through the faces to, you know, just to give some detail to it. That's one. And uh, here's some, another chinoiserie motif, the double bird. And here, building this, or literally sculpting it out of the gesso, which is the whiting or the plaster of Paris. And the gesso comes in uh, various forms. You can buy it in uh, you know, powder form, mix it up and put some rabbit skin glue in it and do your own. Uh, this is the acrylic gesso, which is a little less forgiving, but you can really build with it. And the acrylic gesso, they, they have different varieties of it. Some are more of a modeling type, uh, but I use the real thing here and you can just thicken this up by putting more powder in your mixture. And I kept moving it around, moving it around as it dried and, and basically sculpted them. After it started to dry a bit, I took an X-Acto knife around and, you know, cut some of the areas, leveled it off with a chisel until I got the desire, desired effect. Then I covered the gesso um, with a black pigment. I used uh, rabbit skin glue with, with carbon black and let that, let that dry and then put my sizing on and then covered it with 23 and a half karat gold leaf. Once the gold leaf had set up, I came with a very, uh, almost like a pencil tip and I scratched out the feathers to, to go through the gold into the black. So it's very effective, giving a lot of detail again. And here was a, you know, another, uh, another bird, uh, another class I'd given, and give the same thing. Black background, I'm using, uh, I'm using here a Yurushi lacquer, Yurushi lacquer, uh, it's, it's Japan and China, and it goes on clear from the sumac tree. Very dangerous stuff, you have to wear gloves, you can't, spattered on you you'll get you'll break out with poison all over uh, but putting it on clear and the whole thing turns black then I did the same thing I used the gesso traditional gesso with rabbit skin glue and I modeled this bird on a branch and then I came back it's been damaged here by moving it around a bit but then I came back and I gilded it and um, but I put a coat of the Urushi lacquer over it first and then I tended to go through there's a little eye there and some feathers Again, using a pencil type tip to go through. And again, here's the, your traditional uh, gilding methodology. We'll just go over it real quickly. Uh, class I taught, take some old stock, put a rabbit in it, sliding dovetails, holds the corners together, tip in the French style. Only the French use this, not the Italians or the Americans. And uh, so we're gonna start down here. We're gonna, what we're doing here is we're stippling using the gesso again about 10 coats with rabbit skin glue and it has a really really rough texture and you stipple 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 and each coat has to interlock with the last um, while it's still wet the one bites the next then down here you start abrading it with probably 400 grit wet paper and you go up to almost 2500 grit this is supposed to feel as smooth as metal and it does it's extraordinarily smooth and over here um, I'm showing you a few things right here. I'm actually doing a little bit of carving with some beading here, and I'm showing just some remnants of 
taking a carving tool and doing some nicks, but it doesn't come through that well. But this is your bowl. This is your okra clay, your yellow clay. And the yellow clay is to get down in these areas, these carved areas, in case you have a holiday, and that's the term, or you miss putting your gold in here. The yellow will fill up the crevices and you won't notice the missed gold as much. So it's a way of saving gold, even back to the 17th and 18th century. The red, the red clay, or oak, um, the red clay, which keep in mind, these red clays are come in different color reds from different countries. This is French, there's Italian, there's Japanese, there's English red clay. And you can tell which, which country your frame is from, from the, tell, uh, from the color of red bowl that they're using. This tends to sit on top. I'm just using this to show the different colors. But typically, if I had carving, or, or uh, such as these beads, I would put just the red clay on top. First, I'd use yellow clay to get in between the beads. And in addition, I created these beads. I cut these beads with a carving tool into this quarter round right here. Down here, halfway through, I um, actually took a mold, I took a piece of wood, and I carved out individual beads with a little channel and I laid a string through them and I filled it with the gesso. When it was hard, I pulled the piece of string up and I had all these beads. I took the beads and I glued them in here with more gesso. So two different rationales or two different approaches how to create the beading effect. Here is where I'm showing you that uh, somebody dropped the frame in a past class and it cracked. Here's what I'm showing you, I'm putting the gold down. Um, you know, fresh gold and the top, you take your, your burnishing agate and you burnish this down to get the, the matte finish as compared to the polish finish on top of the beads. Here, I'm starting to patinize. And at the bottom of the frame, it's a total patinization. We can see that with the light. Uh, I'm using various painting pigments and smoke and things like that to achieve the age look. And remember with a typical frame, a period frame, as it sits on a wall like this, the only place you're going to see all this dirt and grime and smoke and fly specks is right here on the bottom. So everything is falling out, all the environmental pollution is coming down. You're going to have it here and on the top of the frame. So when you're trying to give that patinization, that old look, and that is a word, patinization, uh, it's a French word, and it's called uh, you know, acquiring or, or portraying aging, you'll find it up here and on the bottom. And I just want to show some other things, um, you know, when we're getting some gilding um, supplies out right now. This is how clay comes. I don't know if we can get any of this out or not. But it comes in cakes or patties. You may be able to see this in the bag. They look like uh, cow pies in the field. So, and this is red and they come in various clays. Now this is the, uh, this is the apprentice gilder. This is Casper. How are you doing, Casper? What are you doing? Who's a good boy, huh? Who's a good boy? So this is how this comes, and traditional bowl clay comes this way. This is at, uh, picked this up at Lavagere in Paris. And this has to be saturated probably for three or four days until and it's beaten down and uh, likes, it likes the camera. But the clay, the clay is, has to be saturated with water and it has to be mixed and strained and, and mixed with rabbit skin glue until it's ready. Or you can buy pre-made acrylic. So the problem with the acrylic is it never truly hardens or dries. And it doesn't give you that great ability to sand as well as the traditional clays do. And, you know, last but not least, we're uh, doing a little bit of carving here, showing you a leaf, uh, applying some gesso, but that's neither here nor there. Um, here's some crazy uh, variegated reds and uh, different types of, of gold leaf. And this would be uh, if you're doing some contemporary work. So I just happen to have two more of these left. I'm not sure if they make them anymore, but you can create some crazy projects. So anyway, that's what's happening here. And uh, some gilding picking up at the uh, conservation studio. Greg Perry signing off. Thanks for listening. And uh, please, uh, if you uh, subscribe to us on uh, our YouTube channel. So look us up on YouTube. And also on our Instagram channel, which leads to IGTV. And please don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for listening.